When Greg informed me that I had been selected as the 2013 Hall Laureate, I experienced a mix of emotions, surprise, pleasure, and abject terror. <laughs> Being associated through this lecture with one of the two great architects of Canadian Medicare and the remarkable roster of previous Hall Laureates is both a welcome honor and a daunting challenge. As I look back, it's clear to me that being here today is mostly happenstance, good luck rather than good planning. My professional life has been a series of largely serendipitous encounters with people, ideas, and opportunities. The great bluesman, John Lee Hooker, wrote and performed a tune, Call Me Mr. Lucky, which begins with the line, I was born for good luck, bad luck can't do me no harm. As I reflect on my life, both personal and professional, I feel that I've been Mr. Lucky in the people who have nurtured, mentored, and supported me. I'd particularly like to acknowledge my immediate family, my wife, Alba DiCenzo, and my sons, Paul and Evan, for their tolerance and support. Alba has been a boundless source of inspiration and encouragement. And as an added bonus, she may be the world's most meticulous editor. <laughs> Many of you have experienced her editorial talents, I think. Paul has been my source of expert tech support since I require, uh, retired from McMaster and is responsible for the graphics I'm using today. Thanks, Paul. Paul and Evan have cheerfully coped with my sometimes crazy schedule and the times when I've been preoccupied with my work even though they may not have fully understood what I do or why I do it. About 10 years ago, shortly after I shifted into a full-time combination of research, graduate education, and administration, Evan, who was then in his early teens, asked me, what exactly do you do? I explained, not very exactly, that I did research on how to organize, deliver, and pay for health care, to which he responded, why didn't you just keep on being a family doctor and help people? <laughs> I replied somewhat testily that I hoped my research would help people, although I don't think I convinced him, and I'm not even sure I convinced myself. In a variety of roles, as a patient, family physician, teacher, and researcher, I've been a witness to the evolution of healthcare in Canada. I was born in 1942, making me what is sometimes referred to as a war baby. So the first 24 years of my life were pre-Medicare. This slide represents my first encounter with the Canadian healthcare system. These are the hospital bills for my mom and me and the bill from the obstetrician who presided at my birth. The total cost, $148, seems quite modest but my dad's annual salary at the time was only $3,600. So the charges for my birth amounted to 4% of our family income in that year. I hope my parents thought it was worth it. <laughs> I was in medical school at the University of Western Ontario during the gestation and birth of Medicare. In 1965, one year after the Hall Commission report was released, I wrote an article for the University of Western Ontario Medical Journal entitled, Medicare the Facts, which opened with the following lead. Among medical students, and no doubt among physicians as well, the subject of Medicare is discussed often, but not well. Frequently, discussion is based on misconception rather than knowledge. This article is an attempt to present the facts concerning Medicare as a basis for rational discussion. Among the facts, the Liberal government and the NDP were supportive of universal publicly funded and administered medical care insurance, the Social Credit Party, health insurance companies and the Canadian Medical Association were opposed, and the Federal Progressive Conservative Party was silent. 
Forty years later, I'm still attached to the notion of discussion informed by facts, but without any illusion that the facts are all that matters. As medical students, we encountered two classes of patients, private and public. Actually, we mainly saw public patients who lacked private insurance or the means to pay for their care and were housed in multi-bed wards, commonly referred to as the charity wards. Participating in the care of private patients was a rare privilege and occurred only with the consent of the attending physician and the patient. On the other hand, it was not unusual for public patients to be examined en masse by a troop of us students with only the privacy afforded by a curtain and, as I remember, no choice in the matter. By the time I opened my family practice, all of Canada's provinces and territories had joined the Medicare program. However, under the Medical Care Act of 1966, physicians were able to extra bill beyond the fee payable through the provincial territorial medical care plan. Although most family physicians, including me, did not extra bill, the practice became sufficiently common among specialists that extra billing came to be seen as a threat to the principle of access to care based on need. This concern led ultimately to the passage of the Canada Health Act in 1984, which allows the federal government to deduct from federal transfers any money collected through user fees or extra billing. In 1986, the Ontario Medical Association struck against provincial legislation that banned extra billing. Participation in job action was half-hearted, particularly among family physicians. Breaking ranks with the OMA, the Ontario Medical Reform Group, to which I belonged, endorsed the legislation and urged physicians not to participate in the strike, which ultimately collapsed without concessions by the government. More recently, I've been a, a participant, observer, and analyst of the primary care renewal efforts that began in this country at the start of the century. Of course, Medicare, we, the Medicare we have is not the program envisioned by Tommy Douglas or Emmett Hall. In 1961, referring to the proposed Saskatchewan Medical Care Insurance Plan, Douglas said, this medical care plan will prove to be the forerunner of a national medical care insurance plan. It will become the nucleus around which Canada will ultimately build a comprehensive health insurance program which will cover all health services not just hospitalization and medical care, but eventually all other services that people require. Featured prominently in the Hall Commission report was a health charter for Canadians, said to have been written by Hall himself, that calls for a comprehensive universal health service program for Canadians that in includes all health services, preventive, diagnostic, curative, and rehabilitative that modern medical and other sciences can provide. The Commission made specific recommendations for coverage of vision care, dental care, and pharmaceuticals. The medical program envisioned by Douglas, Hall, and others has yet to be realized. Ted Marmer, Professor Emeritus at Yale University, has referred to Canadian Medicare as a public policy miracle. To me, what makes it truly miraculous is that in an in an inherently unequal capitalist society where access to almost all goods and services depends on the ability to pay, the majority of Canadian citizens and policymakers supported and continue to support a program that rests on the principle that access to and quality of medical and hospital care should be determined solely on the basis of need, irrespective of financial means or other considerations. Many of us take pride and delight in this anomaly while brushing aside unsettling questions about the limits of Medicare. If the principle of care based on need deserves our support in relation to hospital and physician services, why should it stop there? What about other beneficial health services such as pharmaceuticals, vision care, dental care, home care, chiropractic services, and rehabilitation therapies? I'd now like to narrow my focus to primary care, which after all is what I'm supposed to be talking about. During the remainder of this talk, I hope to make the following points. A strong primary care sector 
is vital to health system performance and outcomes. Canada's primary care performance lags behind many of our peer countries. Governments at the federal and provincial territorial levels in Canada have made substantial investments in strengthening primary care since 2000. Progress has been uneven across the country and no province or territory has all the essential elements in place. Nevertheless, the reforms are starting to bear fruit. Because the process of primary care renewal is incomplete, substantial further investments are required. Government spending on primary care remains modest. Increased government or total spending on health care is unlikely to threaten economic performance and need not crowd out public spending on other social priorities such as education. And finally, although facts and evidence can inform policy discussions, a clash between libertarian and communitarian values underlies ongoing conflict about the future of Medicare. There is now a compelling body of evidence, much of it produced or summarized by Barbara Starfield, demonstrating the association between prong, strong primary care systems and superior health outcomes and greater health equity, although not necessarily lower health care costs. Statements by Canadian policymakers and commentators recognizing the importance of primary care to health system performance and outcomes are becoming increasingly commonplace. In his opening remarks at last year's Accelerating Primary Care Conference, Fred Horn, Alberta's Minister of Health and Wealth, Wellness, referred to putting primary care where it rightfully belongs at the center of the health system. The Drummond Commission on the Reform of Ontario's Public Services recommended in its 2012 report that the government make primary care a focal point of a new integrated health model. Many of you have probably seen this chart summarizing the Commonwealth Fund's 2010 assessment of the comparative performance of the health systems of seven high-income countries, mirror, mirror on the wall. The performance rankings were based on OECD health data and international surveys of patients and primary care physicians conducted by the fund. The two top rankings are dark blue, and the lowest three rankings are light blue. Underlying this picture are some potential policy lessons for primary care. Two countries stand out in overall performance, the Netherlands and the UK. Although they differ substantially regarding healthcare financing and the role of private insurance, they have in common many features of primary care Shared, those shared features include mandatory patient registration with a primary care provider, no primary care user charges, local primary care governance, primary care gatekeeping, capitation-based blended payment for primary care physicians, interdisciplinary primary care teams, and major investments in quality improvement initiatives and electronic medical records in primary care. To illustrate, EMR use in 2012 among primary care physicians was 98% and 97% respectively in the Netherlands and the UK. The relationship between overall health system performance and investments in primary care and the commonalities in the primary care systems of the two highest performing countries could be pure coincidence, but to me that seems unlikely. Their level of commitment to strengthening primary care and their system features deserve serious consideration by Canadian policymakers and primary care stakeholders. While many other high income countries focused attention on primary care policy and investments during the 1990s, Canada barely man managed to tread water and has yet to catch up. As a result, Canada's primary care performance continues to lag behind many of our peers, particularly in timely access to primary care and primary care infrastructure. The next few slides draw on data from the Commonwealth Fund's International Health Policy Surveys. 
They highlight opportunities for improvement in Canadian performance by showing the gap between Canada's performance and that of the best performing countries in primary care access, patient centeredness and engagement, quality of care, and infrastructure. Whether assessed from the perspective of the general adult population, people with chronic or recent severe health problems, or primary care physicians, the gap for many measures of access to primary care is wide. These radar graphs and those that follow show the percent of respondents who responded favorably to the relevant items, with the concentric lines representing increments of 20% from the center of the graph to the outer 100% line. The blue line shows Canada's performance, while the red line shows the best performer among the countries surveyed. For example, Canada tied for last among 11 countries in the percentage of adults who report having an appointment the same or next day with a doctor or nurse the last time they were sick. Among sicker adults, Canada ranked last in the proportion of people who found it easy or very easy to get medical care outside regular practice hours without going to the emergency room. And second last in the percentage of primary care physicians who reported having an arrangement for patients to be seen by a doctor or nurse if needed when the practice is closed. On patient reported measures of patient centeredness and patient engagement, Canada's performance is not substantially lower than the best performers. However, Canada falls short on physician reported measures. For example, Canada ranks last in the percentage of primary care physicians who report that patients have the option of requesting appointments or referrals online or emailing about a medical question or concern. The discrepancy between physician and patient reported measures is likely related to the physician reported measures being a reflection of the availability of inf health information technology rather than patient centeredness or engagement per se. The quality of primary care in Canada appears to be similar to that of the best performing countries on most measures. However, all countries perform poorly on the proportion of sicker adults who report that their regular doctor or someone in, someone in their doctor's practice always helps them coordinate or arrange the care they receive from other doctors and places. Canada ranks seventh of 11 countries in the proportion of people with diabetes who reported that their feet were examined in the past year. Primary care infrastructure in Canada is plainly inferior to that of most other countries, including included in the Commonwealth Fund surveys, ranking in the bottom half on all but one measure in the 2012 survey of primary care physicians. For example, Canada ranked second last in the percentage of primary care physicians whose practice included at least one full-time equivalent non-physician health care provider. Canada also ranked second last in the use of electronic medical records by primary care physicians and on several measures of EMR functionality. Infrastructure for performance measurement, feedback, and quality improvement is grossly underdeveloped in Canadian primary care relative to most of the comparator countries. Responses to the Commonwealth Fund patient surveys are stratified by income, providing an opportunity to examine income-related equity of primary care in Canada. This slide shows responses from sicker Canadian adults with above and below average income on selected measures. The blue line represents those with above average income and the red line those with below average income. For several measures, for example, the proportion who have a regular doctor or place of care and the proportion who report that their regular doctor or someone in their doctor's practice always helps coordinate or arrange care they receive elsewhere, the differences are minimal or absent. However, the differences are more substantial, although not huge, for other measures. For example, the percentage who report having an appointment with a doctor or nurse on the same day or next day the last time they were sick, and the percentage of respondents with at least one chronic condition who reported that a healthcare professional had helped them make a treatment plan during the last year. 
After two decades of stagnation, many of the provinces and territories began in the early 2000s to invest in policies and programs designed to strengthen primary care. These initiatives were enabled by an improved fiscal climate and spurred by growing public and professional dissatisfaction with the status quo, the reports of the Roman Oak Commission and of the Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology chaired by Senator Michael Kirby, both of which highlighted the centrality of primary care to health system performance. And finally, federal funding targeting primary care reform channeled through the Primary Health Care Transition Fund of 2000 and the Health Reform Fund in 2003. Several primary care reform initiatives have been implemented broadly in one or more jurisdictions. They include primary care networks, interprofessional primary care teams, patient enrollment with a primary care provider, blended physician payment schemes, and targeted financial incentives, local or regional primary care governance, expansion of the pool of primary care providers, including both physicians and other health professionals, implementation of electronic medical records, and quality improvement training and support. The content and pace of primary care reform have been highly variable among the provinces and territories. This chart from the discussion paper toward a primary care strategy for Canada, prepared by Monica Agarwal and myself on behalf of the Canadian Working Group for Primary Healthcare Improvement, illustrates that variability. It shows the extent to which each of the provinces and territories has implemented features of primary care systems that appear on the basis of evidence and international experience to enable high levels of primary care performance. Green cells indicate widespread or system level implementation. Yellow cells indicate limited implementation and empty cells indicate no implementation. The chart was prepared almost one year ago, so it may not perfectly re represent current realities. As you can see, most of these features have been implemented widely in one or more provinces or territories. As William Gibson has famously said, the future is already out there, it's just very unevenly distributed. The exceptions, those features that have not been broadly implemented in any province or territory, are patient engagement, both in their own care and in the design of primary care services, systematic ongoing measurement of primary care performance, and appropriate investment in primary care research, research, research training, and research application. How these reforms have affected healthcare processes and outcomes has become a burning question for many policymakers, especially in provinces that have invested most heavily in primary care reform. Although understandable, the question is in some respects problematic. First, it begs the question of timeline, lag. How soon can the impacts of structured reforms be expected to manifest? In the case of most reforms introduced over the past decade, some delay is to be expected, especially for complex interventions such as interprofessional teams, which require a realignment of primary care culture. Second, impacts need to be measured to be observed, and no province or territory has a primary care performance measurement system in place that tracks change over time across an appropriate set of performance measures. Nevertheless, serial administrations of the Commonwealth Fund patient and provider surveys identify some trends over time in a subset of measures, some of which are shown in the next few slides. Canadians' confidence in the health system has increased steadily during the 2000s. The percentage of Canadians who think the system needs, works well and merely needs tweaking has increased, while the percentage who think the system needs a complete re rebuild has declined. The precipitous fall in confidence between 1988 and 1998 bears witness to the disastrous consequences of healthcare funding constraints and cutbacks during the 1990s. Canadians' rating of the care provided by their regular doctor or place of care has also risen. Access to primary care is becoming more timely while remaining well outside bragging range. More Canadians with chronic or recent serious health problems are being seen the same or next day when sick 
and fewer are waiting six days or longer. The use and functionality of electronic medical records are increasing, but are still at or near the bottom in international comparisons. Other trends are disturbing. Between 2004 and 2010, the percentage of Canadians who report having a regular doctor or usual place of care fell, and the use of emergency rooms increased. In my home province of Ontario, ISIS, the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, in collaboration with Health Quality Ontario, has begun to produce six monthly time series data on primary care performance at the practice, regional, and provincial levels using administrative data. The measures cover aspects of illness burden, preventive care, chronic disease management, and health services utilization. In the two and one half years between April 2008 and September 2011, appropriate screening for colorectal cancer among the population targeted for screening increased from 43 to 57 percent. During the same period, measures of recommended diabetes care, hemoglobin A1C testing, annual retinal examination, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol testing, and prescribing of cholesterol-lowering drugs showed a steady but modest improvement. The last decade has seen profound changes in the funding and organization of primary care in most provinces and territories. As is clear from the chart I showed earlier, progress has been uneven and no province or territory has all the elements in place to raise primary care to the level of the best performing countries internationally. The system features that based on international evidence and experience enable high performing primary care need to be spread widely within and across provinces and territories. In my view, features most likely to yield the biggest benefits include creation and support of inclusive primary care governance at the local and regional levels, interprofessional primary care teams, patient enrollment with a primary care provider, comprehensive primary care performance measurement systems that can support decision making, quality improvement, and accountability at the practice, organization, community, regional, provincial, territorial, and national levels, quality improvement training and support, expanded use and functionality of electronic medical records, and explicit attention to equity. I see inclusive and effective primary care governance at the local level as a crucial element, one that is currently missing in most provincial and territorial health systems. In all but a few Canadian communities, numerous mainly small primary care organizations operate independently, lack a common voice, and rarely share resources and expertise. Given this fragmentation, effective integration of primary care with other health and social service sectors is virtually impossible. Horizontal integration of primary care is a prerequisite to vertical integration. Local, appropriately resourced primary care organizations can assume collective responsibility <clears throat> for clinical performance and service delivery, respond to community needs, negotiate relationships and joint initiatives with other health and social services, and coordinate and support the sharing of resources, performance measurement activities, and quality improvement efforts. Despite universal insurance coverage and the absence of user charges for primary care services, the available research evidence points to persisting inequities in access to and quality of primary care services related to income, education, immigration, and Aboriginal status. At the primary care practice level, these relationships remain largely invisible because information about patients' socioeconomic characteristics is rarely included in the medical record and almost never analyzed in relation to appropriateness of care. Primary care providers, managers, and policymakers need both information and resources to develop and implement targeted programs to address inequity at the practice and system levels. The mechanisms underlying health inequities are poorly understood, but a recent study by Ola Gaisano and Huang at the Center for Inner City Health at the University of Toronto suggests that the attitudes and practices 
of, pr of primary care providers may be a significant factor. In this study, researchers playing the role of patients seeking a primary care physician made an unannounced call to a random sample of family physicians in Toronto. They portrayed either a high socioeconomic status person, a bank employee transferred to the city, or a low status person, a, socioeconomic, a, a social assistance recipient with either the presence or absence of chronic conditions. Both low socioeconomic status and chronic health conditions had independent negative effects on the likelihood of obtaining an appointment. After adjustment for other factors, high socioeconomic status increased the likelihood of being offered an appointment by 78%. Given that primary care reform is unfinished in every province and territory and barely begun in some, substantial additional investments are required. And there's the rub. In Ontario and perhaps elsewhere, there's a view among some policymakers that we've done primary care, we've spent a lot and have little to show for it, so let's move on to something else. In his 2011 report, the Auditor General of Ontario drew attention to the 32% increase in provincial expenditures on primary care between 2006-07 and 2009-10, without noting that overall government health care expenditures rose 23% during the same period. Primary care expenditures in Ontario as a percentage of total provincial he government health care expenditures increased over the three years from 7.5 to 8.1%, hardly a huge increase or a huge percentage. In 2009-10, provincial government primary care expenditures were barely equal to the combined budgets of the nine largest Toronto hospitals. The plea for continuing investment in strengthening primary care, or for that matter any other health sector, runs up against several arguments. The main ones relate to rising expenditures on health as a proportion of provincial territorial government budgets, and rising total public and private health care expenditures as a proportion of gross domestic product. Often these two are lumped together as a concern about Medicare's sustainability. These issues feature prominently in Jeffrey Simpson's recent book, Chronic Condition, Why Canada's Healthcare System Needs to be Dragged into the 21st Century. Regarding provincial territorial healthcare budget, Simpson worries, understandably I think, about healthcare crowding out other spending such as education. He writes that, Healthcare is devouring budgets as more money gets shoveled into healthcare. And that before the end of this decade, healthcare will likely consume more than half the budget of every province. If you haven't noticed, the healthcare is glutton metaphor is prominent in Simpson's writing. These statements assume that taxes will not increase in keeping with government healthcare spending. Simpson's position, and he's been by no means alone, is that tax in increases can't or won't, and reading between the lines shouldn't happen. Although not widely advertised as such, Canada is a low-tax country. In 2010, the last year for which international comparative data are available, total tax revenue in Canada as a percent of GDP was 12th lowest at 31% among the 34 OECD countries. Below the average of 34%. Eight countries had tax revenues above 42% of GDP. Proclamations about the necessity of maintaining low taxes as a stimulus to economic growth routinely issue from editorials, op-eds, and the mouths of politicians both in and out of government. Last month, the Conference Board of Canada issued How Canada Performs, a report card on Canada which ranked the performance of 17 high-income countries in seven categories, including economic performance and social quality of life. This slide shows the correlation, or rather the lack of correlation, between the conference board rankings of economic performance and tax revenues as a percentage of GDP, as reported by the OECD. 
Could it be that low taxes are not essential to economic success after all? This slide shows the relationship between tax expenditures and rankings of social quality of life based on 16 measures, including income inequality, child working age and elderly poverty, youth unemployment, gender income gap, social support, life satisfaction, suicides, homicides, and burglaries. The correlation between the two, 0.642, is highly significant. It appears that low taxes may incur a large social cost without an economic benefit, the worst of both worlds. Simpson and others view the increasing share of GDP accounted for by health expenditures as a drag on the economy. He observes with alarm, when Medicare began, health care claimed 7% of the country's economy. Today, it eats up 11.7%. Again, the healthcare is glutton metaphor. But is that necessarily a bad thing? The Conference Board of Canada, in its January 2013 report, Healthcare in Canada, an Economic Growth Engine, describes the health sector as an important driver of economic growth, and reported that healthcare spending in Canada contributed 10.1% of the national GDP in 2011 and supported 2.1 million jobs directly and through the supply chain. They estimate that for every dollar spent on health care, the various levels of government collected 21.7 cents in taxes. Ironically, the main solutions proposed by Simpson and his ilk increased private delivery and a parallel private system that would allow those with private insurance or deep pockets to obtain faster or better service outside the public system are more likely to increase rather than decrease total health care expenditures. To quote the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an organization that by the way has always been private sector friendly, whatever the role played in a health system, private insurance has added to total health expenditures. Countries that have multiple sources of private coverage including those with significant private health insurance market size, tend to be those with the highest total spending levels per capita, such as the United States, Switzerland, Germany, and France." End of quote. The OECD also points out, and again I'm quoting, when public cover is not comprehensive or universal, private health insurance has enhanced access to care but such access is often inequitable, largely because private health insurance is typically purchased by high-income groups. Privately insured patients may benefit, in particular by obtaining shorter wait times for elective surgery, but there is no clear evidence that waiting times are also reduced in the public sector." End of quote. Expanding private payment would have the additional perverse effect of exacerbating income inequality, the most potent social determinant of health. As shown in a report issued earlier this month by the Canadian Institute for Health Information, Lifetime Distributional Effects of Publicly Financed Healthcare in Canada, publicly financed healthcare redistributes income from richer to poorer Canadians. Summing up, continued investments are needed to strengthen primary care as the foundation of a high-performing healthcare system. And if need be, there's room to increase taxes to make those investments. But facts and evidence are not the main determinants of public policy. When all is said and done, the struggles over Medicare are about values. Jeffrey Simpson, and he's, again, he's in considerable company, sees what he calls the ideological prisms through which defenders observe the system as the fundamental barrier to fixing Medicare. He goes on to say that ideology inspired by vacuous slogans about Canadian values should be replaced by a more functional framework of what works best at lower cost for Canadians. He contrasts the ideology of Medicare supporters with the practical, presumably non-ideological, views of people like himself. Simpson has this wrong. The clash isn't between ideology and pragmatism, but between competing sets of values, libertarian on the one side and communitarian on the other. 
The libertarian perspective is, in its most extreme form, is captured by Mar in Margaret Thatcher's famous statement, there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. Or as Lily Tomlin has said with tongue in cheek, remember, we're all in this alone. <laughs> libertarian values include personal responsibility, unfettered autonomy and choice, small government, low taxes, personal as opposed to public spending, and unconstrained opportunities for increasing individual income and wealth. Communitarian values include shared responsibility, equality, fairness, collective rather than individual solutions to social problems, redistribution of wealth and income, and a sense of community. But values and beliefs are not randomly distributed in the population. As the next two slides show, they vary systematically with income, or to use a less fashionable term, class. The graph summarized data from a 2012 ECOS poll commissioned by the Conference Board of Canada and compare the views of low and high income respondents on the determinants of health and private health care delivery. This slide shows the percentage of high and low income Canadians who see lifestyle, the physical environment, publicly funded health care, and income level as extremely important determinants of health. Ironically, the Canadians who benefit most from income as a determinant of health are the least likely to recognize its importance. They are also most likely to support private delivery of health services and least likely to see a parallel private health care as a threat to the public system. The relationship between values and class means that in the struggle to maintain, improve, and expand Medicare as a program that embodies the core value articulated by Douglas and Hall, healthcare access and quality based solely on need will continue to face opposition from individuals and organizations whose economic and political influence is disproportionate to their numbers. However, the lineup today is essentially the same as it was when Medicare was being debated in the 1960s. I hope that I speak for many in this room when I say that we won then and we can win again. Thank you for listening.